appreciate the opportunity that we have to come together with you around the Word of God. We are so thankful for the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Father, Jesus said. And he said, I go back to the Father and I'll pray him and he will send you another comforter. Just like the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank the Lord for the Holy Spirit. And we are thankful that he's the one that opens the scriptures to us. And he does so through God called men. And he does so to those who he has given ears to hear. Have you ever noticed Jesus saying, uh, he that hath ears, let him hear. And I used to think, well, everybody's got ears. But that wasn't what he was talking about. Everybody that has the spiritual uh, uh, gift of discernment and understanding. Uh, I, I love that 1 John 5, 20 verse. The, the Lord Jesus Christ has come, and with him he hath given us an understanding. So thank God that you have the understanding and that we have the Spirit of God to be able to open the Scriptures to you. And we want you to turn in your Bibles to the first chapter of the book of Acts and the first chapter of the book of Luke. We want to look at the subject, Restoring the Kingdom. The book of Acts, chapter 1, and the book of Luke, chapter number 1. We'll begin with Acts 1 and verse 1. This is Luke, the physician, writing to his friend Theophilus. The word Theophilus means loved of God. The former treatise have I made. Now that former treatise was the book of Luke, the entire book of Luke, the 24th chapters in the book of Luke. He calls it a treatise. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Friend, that's the description of the gospel. The gospel is what Jesus did and what he said about it. That revelation is the revelation of God. Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost hath given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Now, that verse number one, the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. All right, let's go back to the book of Luke in chapter number one and verse number one, and let's read part of this treatise that Luke wrote. And it's very interesting. Luke 1 and verse 1. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they deliver them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. So this was Luke prompted by the Holy Spirit through his relationship through this friend Theophilus to write 24 chapters in the book of Luke. Isn't that amazing? The Holy Spirit used that relationship to cause Luke to pin down everything so his friend Theophilus could know the certainty of those things. And he says something in verse 3 of, of Luke chapter 1. It seemed good to me also having had perfect understanding. Now, go to the book of Luke, chapter 24, the last chapter in the book of Luke. Luke 24 and verse number 45. How can Luke say he had perfect understanding of all the things that Jesus did and taught? In chapter 24, <coughs> excuse me, and verse number 44 and 45, this is Jesus talking to the disciples for the last time uh, as recorded in Luke 24 in the uh, upper room where they were meeting together. Luke 24, 44, and he, Christ, 
said unto them, the disciples, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. So he said the whole book of the scriptures, the whole book of the Bible, all the different men in all the different ages, some of them were psalmists. Moses wrote the law. The prophets are all different, but every one of them used of God. And it all comes together for one purpose, and that is to reveal Christ. Now listen at verse 45. After he says that to them, then open he their understanding. That's how Luke could say, I have a perfect understanding. Because the Lord Jesus Christ opened the scriptures to them. And uh, in verse number 32, he said, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us, by the way, and while he opened uh, to us the scriptures? So Christ opened the scriptures to them, and then in verse 45, he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Dear soul, it's not enough for you to have a Bible. It's not enough for us to have different translations and commentaries and helps. Uh, we have a need to cry out to God and say, Lord, open my understanding that I might understand what you are saying. Dear soul, Every cult, every false denomination, the harlot church, all have Bibles. It's not that we are without the scriptures. It's that we are without understanding of the scriptures. How in the world can some of these denominations come up with this stuff and seriously believe it and practice it and seriously think, that they are going to attain a place in heaven with God. It's unbelievable. It's because they don't have a proper understanding of the scriptures. So Luke says, I have perfect understanding. And uh, now he's going to take up his pen again in the book of Acts. He's going to write the book of Acts. And he again returns to his relationship to Theophilus, again, Acts chapter 1, verse 1. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. He sums up his entire book of Luke, which we call the gospel, and it is. He's one of the gospels, and the gospel is described as what Jesus did and taught until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. He didn't leave and he, wasn't, he didn't ascend until he had give, given commandment unto the apostles that he had chosen unto himself. Now, he says in verse 3, To whom, to those apostles, he had showed himself alive by his passion. Now that word passion, we, talk, we see that there are plays and there are different things that are set forth as called the passion of Christ. It's talking about his death. It's talking about his sufferings on the cross, his passion, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, after he had been so cruelly crucified by many infallible proofs. That is, they were unquestionable evidences by many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days. The Lord Jesus Christ, once he had risen from the dead, he made sure that from the time of his resurrection to the time of his ascension, there was a full 40 days. And in that time, he made sure that everybody understood that he was alive. He showed it to him, And during that time, he made sure that he gave commandment to the apostles and established the foundation of the church by opening unto them the scriptures and by opening unto them their understanding. You and I need to be praying right now that God would, in this message, 
Open our understanding. Do you want to know what God wants you to know in this? Is this just a religious performance with you? Or do you want to hear from God? He has separated you from gathering together so that you might not be distracted by your favorite friend or by your favorite uh, 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 subject that you want to hear about. And he separated you unto himself. Now, why did he do that? That he might show unto you by many infallible proofs the things of himself. So ask the Lord. Seek and ye shall find. Not God will open it to you. And, and uh, uh, so he says, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Please be aware of that phrase. The title of our lesson today is Restoring the Kingdom. Now, God is not going to restore the kingdom, so it's not really a great title, but it is a good title because it's biblical. Uh, verse 6, he, the, the disciples ask him, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? That's where we get our title of our lesson today, Restoring the Kingdom. But what we're going to see is that wasn't a good question. That wasn't the way of God. That wasn't what God intended to do. It wasn't going to be a restoration. It was going to be a launching of the spiritual kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to see some things about the kingdom to make you understand that the apostles in that day were just as wrong by taking, what's this word, literally, the kingdom of God as those are in our day who think that Jesus is going to come and set up a literal kingdom in physical, literal Jerusalem, and there he's going to reign. That's all a bunch of baloney. My words are spirit and they are alive. And dear soul, those things are not spiritual. Listen, these people wanted to have Jesus tell them that they were going to get another king like David. And like David, he was going to go out and conquer all these other nations and bring them into subjection unto Israel. And that they, they wanted him to have a, a king like David and, and had a second king, the son of David, Solomon, so that they could enjoy so much wealth that when they dropped silver, they didn't reach down and pick it up. It was so common, silver was so common that they didn't consider it to be a loss if it fell out of their pocket. That's what they wanted. And so they didn't understand what Jesus was saying to them. He said, this is how you pray. Thy kingdom come. Thy will, not my will, not Israel's will, not religion's will, my will, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So even if it is an earthly kingdom, it is a spiritual kingdom that is fulfilling the mind and purposes of God as surely as as the kingdom of heaven is. It's going to be spiritual. I had a couple come to me and said, we want to take you out to lunch. And of course, preachers are always ready for that. And when they got me out to lunch, I found out, you know, exactly what they wanted. The other shoe fell. And they said, we want you to know that we appreciate your ministry, but we want you to know that we... We hold everything to be literal. We don't want you to be preaching to us anything that's not literal. I knew what they meant. And I said, well, do you think God's people are literally four-legged, woolly sheep? They said, of course not. That's figurative. Oh, but you want me to preach it literal and say, 
God's people are animals. They're sheep. Now, do you want me to preach that Jesus Christ literally has a sword for a tongue? Well, of course not. Well, the Bible said in the book of the Revelation that his, out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword. It says his feet are as brass and his hair is like wool and his eyes are like fire. Is that the picture of Jesus that you want me to literally put? Well, no. Well, then, what are you talking about? They're talking about this. They wanted a literal, physical, earthly kingdom according to the natural kingdom of Israel under David. The problem with that is it goes against everything that the Holy Spirit brought in the very first gospel message ever heard on earth. All you need to do is turn to the book of Acts chapter 2 and read what the Holy Spirit said through the apostle Peter and understand that, that uh, David did not have any idea that it was David himself the Lord was speaking of but it was the Messiah. Listen. Let me find it in, in Acts chapter 2. Ye men of Israel, verse 22, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God Ye have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Listen, for David speaketh concerning him, for David speaketh concerning the Messiah, for David speaketh concerning Christ. I foresaw the Lord always before my face. I was seeing Christ and his kingdom, not me and mine, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. <clears throat> Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. I'm going to die, but I'm going to rest in hope because thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me interpret that for you. That was the book of Psalms, Psalm 16. He says, let me, uh, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David that he is both dead and buried. And that's where we need to leave him. And that's where we need to leave that literal physical kingdom. Dead and buried. And his sepulcher is with us unto this day. I can take you to the cemetery and show you where David's body is. Here's what happened. Verse 30 of Acts chapter 2. Therefore being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins... According to the flesh, he would raise up not Solomon, not Rehoboam, not any of his other kin, uh, children. He had sworn to him that he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. So when I read in the Old Testament that David's throne was going to be eternal, I don't go literal with it and say, well, David's going to be brought back and the literal kingdom of literal Israel is going to literally be on the earth again. I understand by this that God swore to David that of the fruit of David's loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this, David, seeing this, before spake of the resurrection of Christ. 
not of David's resurrection, but of Christ's resurrection. Psalm 16, 8 through 11 is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, not David. He, seeing this, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. That is Christ. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, now that he's been uh, resurrected, and now that he's been ascended, we know that he's on the right hand of God exalted, because he has, uh, we've received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, which he has shed forth this, which he now see and hear. And he goes on in verse 34, For David is not ascended into heavens. David went down into the grave. Christ went up into heaven. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord has said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes my footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly. Get this now. Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made, quote, that same Jesus whom you have crucified. He hath made him both Lord and Christ. Period. So people who want the scriptures to be applied literally, straight across the board. I believe that Jesus Christ literally died on the cross. I believe that he literally raised people from the dead. I believe that he was literally born of a virgin. But I believe those things are presented to us that we might come to understand that God takes the things that are made to show us the invisible things of God, Romans 1.20. So these people in Acts chapter number 1, these disciples even, were deadly wrong about the kingdom. It was not going to be a restored kingdom. Listen, let's read on. Verse number 4 of Acts chapter 1. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Now, yes, they were to stay at Jerusalem. That's where this thing was to start. Look down in verse 8. Ye shall be midway of verse 8 of Acts chapter 1. Ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. So it starts at Jerusalem, but it doesn't stay at Jerusalem. You just have to go on over to about the 8th chapter of the book of Acts and see that this thing was scattered by great persecution. It says, And Saul was consenting unto his death. Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul the apostle, was consenting unto Stephen's death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad. God emptied out Jerusalem of all except the apostles, it says in Acts 8, 1. So God, he, he scatters them everywhere and says, I don't want you just hanging around in Jerusalem. I don't want you just congregation in, congregating and saying, oh, we're having a great time, the Lord must be. Get out there and preach the gospel to every creature. That's what you're supposed to do. So we see that he's told them to stay at Jerusalem, but only until the Holy Spirit came. Verse 4 of Acts 1. And being assembled together with them. Christ being assembled together with the 120 in the upper room. 
commanded them. He is the sole commander. It's not a suggestion, friend. It's a command that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John, John the Baptist, truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And we got a denomination that said being baptized with the Holy Ghost means you learn you start speaking in tongues. That ain't what the Lord said. It's amazing how wrong some doctrine is of some denominations that is not provable provable by the Bible, but it is it is proved by the Bible to be absolutely inerrant that people still hold on to because they want that tradition. Listen. John truly baptized with water. But I'm going to baptize you with Holy Ghost not many days hence. All right. Now begins the question and answer session. Verse 6, Acts 1. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou, watch these words, at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Now, I looked up that word restore, and it means to reconstitute. It, it, it means uh, to reconstruct or recompose. Wilt thou at this time restore again? And every time that Hebrew, excuse me, that Greek word is seen in your Bible, it's translated restore. So I can't show you another word in English to say, well, this is what it means. It always means restore. And notice the first two letters. Restore. It had to be stored to begin with if he's going to restore it. But he said, this ain't going to be no baked, uh, you know, half-baked kingdom. This ain't going to be no uh, half-baked kingdom brought out and, and, and puffed up and brought, and brought forth and, uh, you know, make, make it a little bit better and set it back up again. It's, that's your idea, not Christ. Listen, wilt thou then... At this time, restore again the kingdom to Israel. And again, in Acts chapter 2, verse 29 through 36, the Holy Spirit speaking through the apostle Peter clearly lays out the purposes and intents of God that shows that this question has no, has no validity. It, it, it's... It, it doesn't even pertain to what God intends to do. But it's what they wanted. That's, these disciples were as much deceived about the kingdom being restored to physical, literal Israel as most of the so-called Christians are in our day. And the reason that those disciples in Acts chapter 1 we're not clear concerning the kingdom is because the Holy Spirit hadn't come on them. Dare I make an application of that and tell you it's the same thing in our day. The reason most people are looking for the wrong kind of kingdom to be set up and established in a wrongful way is because they don't have the Holy Spirit opening the scriptures unto them, and opening their understanding. Brother Gene, that's kind of hard, but it's kind of true. It don't matter how hard it is. It's the truth, their soul. We need, to, we, we need to stop this stinking thinking and get into the spiritual mindedness that God would have us in. He's not going to restore, make over, you know, bring it in and, and straighten out the dents in the fender and repaint it and all that kind of stuff. He's going to bring a brand new kingdom. Peter went from, are you going to restore the kingdom? 
in Acts chapter 1 till it's a heavenly kingdom. David didn't even think that it was going to be him sitting on the throne. He knew that it was going to be Christ sitting on the throne. What happened to Peter between Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2? The Holy Spirit fell upon him. God opened his eyes. God anointed his heart and mind and made him see some things that had to do with a spiritual kingdom. That's what we need today. Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Verse 7. And he, Christ, said unto them, the apostles, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. He, he made them understand that you, you've got the shotgun picked up by the wrong end and you're fixing to get your head blowed off. It's not about times and seasons. It's, it's about the Holy Spirit giving you the, uh, the spiritual understanding. And he tells them in verse number 8 what they should do. In verse 7, it is not. That's a negative word. You shouldn't be doing this. But in verse number 8, it says, But, contrary to that, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now, he didn't say you're going to be able to receive spiritual discernment and you and Nostradamus is going to be able to figure out everything from here throughout the end of the world. And don't let that fool you, friend. Nostradamus can say, you know, the cat is black and they turn that into something that you wouldn't believe, something stupid. They just make his words fit anything. Leave Nostradamus alone and get back to Christ. I don't know who I said that for, but somebody needed that. Listen. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And what will it do? The Holy Spirit, the another, another comforter, just like Christ, is going to come and interpret the scriptures for you. Open up your heart. Open up the scriptures. Cause you to understand and what is, what is the purpose of that? And ye shall be witnesses unto me. That's where we ought to put the emphasis. The emphasis is not trying to find out and figure out every jot and tittle and find out how many hairs in that horse's tail over there in Revelation chapter 6. Not trying to figure out where Cain got his wife and all that foolishness. Our responsibility is... The Holy Spirit is now come. Christ is now on his throne. And you are to go forth and bring and, and be a witness of me. He, where did he say? Both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and in the uttermost part of the earth. And when they, he had spoken these things, while they beheld. Last word. Last word. This is what I, I'm leaving you with. Witnesses. Not, not, I want my son to sit on the right hand and the other on the left hand in your kingdom. Not looking for a position and looking for wealth and looking for power for self. But here's what the whole thing's been about. Everything from the book of Genesis to the book of Malachi has been about this. Getting you ready to go forth from Jerusalem out into Judea, yes, into Samaria and into the uttermost part of the earth and being witnesses unto me. That's why the Holy Spirit's coming. The Holy Spirit's not coming to give you an understanding of some kind of millennial kingdom down the road. And by the way, that couple that came, they left. And dear soul, I'm still preaching the same thing, and I don't intend to change because this is the truth that God has revealed to me. If you don't believe that, that's fine with me. I never have said that anybody has to stay with me to be able to know God. But I'm going to tell you this. 
whether I have a whether I have a pulpit or not, whether I have a church or not, whether I have opportunity to preach or not, I'm not going to change my mind. God gave me this. This is the revelation of God by the Holy Spirit. So it doesn't make any difference whether you believe it or receive it or you like or don't like the one that's giving it to you. It's God's Word. And we all will have to stand before Him who does have fiery eyes and a double-edged sword in His mouth and He will judge us all according to to my gospel, the Apostle Paul said. Listen, and when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, you can't be a witness if you don't see something. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you God, I promise. Well, tell me what happened on uh, the night of June the 23rd, 1900, whatever. Well, my neighbor said, out of order. I don't want to hear what your neighbor said. I want to hear what you saw. Well, I didn't see nothing. I just heard you're dismissed. While they beheld, dear soul, he that seeth the Son and believeth on him hath life. Have you seen anything? Not by the physical eyes, but by the spiritual heart. While, uh, when they had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. He's gone. Well, I really enjoyed him when we picked up all those 12 baskets full of fish that was left over from that little bitty meager start that we started out with. We fed 5,000 people. on that grassy hillside and still had far more left than what we started out with. I like that. I wish we could have, no, he's gone. Okay, what am I to do? Well, let's see if we can't start a big old mega church and make a lot of money. No, that ain't what he told you to do. Well, let's, 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 let's get deep into theology and teach you know, theological truths. Dear soul, our theology should be right, but that ain't what he told us to do. He told us to tell everything we've seen. And the reason churches and denominations are spreading so much error and lies is because they hadn't seen anything. They're not witnesses. What did you see? Well, I saw this and that. You see it yourself? Yes. Okay. He's a good witness. He's telling us what he saw. Dear soul, if you didn't see anything, you can't say anything. Listen. And while they looked steadfastly upward toward heaven, why were they doing that? As he went up, the higher he went, the more they looked up. So behold, two men stood by them. These were not up there with Christ. These two angels stood by them, said, let's get back down to earth. Some people are so heavenly minded, they have no earthly use. Listen. As he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Here comes the next word from God, and it's those heavenly messengers that are standing on earth, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And then what did they do? Did what Jesus told them. They returned to Jerusalem. So we understand and see, dear soul, that the Lord Jesus Christ, he answers their question in a way that they don't think is a real answer. 
Wilt thou again at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And his answer was, The Holy Spirit's coming, and you shall receive power to be witnesses unto me into Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the other most part of the earth. That's his answer. And as he's taken up, because that's the last thing he's going to say to them. Two men doesn't, st doesn't you know, gravitate up in the atmosphere. They're standing on earth. God's, God's focus then is earthly. Standing here with you guys, what are y'all doing? Well, we're just trying to see him for as long as we can. You know, he gave you something to do. What did he tell you to do? Go back to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And then ye shall be witnesses. So go back to Jerusalem and do what God told you. Well, we'd rather do some other stuff because it's more exciting. I give you the harlot church. Oh, my soul. Listen. Let's, let's look uh, at some of the things that we can see uh, about the kingdom. Look at John chapter 18. John chapter 18. <clears throat> let's see what verse. John chapter 18. Then where do we start? Verse 33. John 18, 33. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself? Or did others tell it thee of me? Is that an internal revelation that you have had by the Holy Spirit? And you know that I am the king of the Jews? Or is this just some rumor you trying to squash? Pilate answered and made him mad. Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Now listen. This is coming out of the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ in an earthly court just prior to his going to his death. Here comes the truth. Jesus answered, My kingdom. He didn't say anything about the kingdom of the Jews. He said, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, you would know it because then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. Earthly kingdoms want to disrupt the atoning work of the Son of God. If my kingdom were of this world, they would fight you in all of Rome so that I wouldn't be crucified. What did he call Peter when Peter tried that business with him? Get thee behind me, Satan. Lord, that shall not happen to you. I'm not going to let that happen to you. Get thee hence, Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. What did he call Judas when Judas betrayed him? Friend. Why? Because Judas was trying to help him get to the cross so he could make some money. Peter was trying to help him stay away from the cross because he didn't understand the things of the Spirit. Jesus called Peter Satan and he called Judas friend. And Jesus told Pilate, if my kingdom were of this world, they would fight you. Now, do we have any example of People who say that they are of the kingdom of Christ who have started wars. Mm hmm What do you know about them? What about the Crusades? Went over there to fight the Turks and anybody else that resisted them and tried to reconquer Jerusalem. That wasn't no more of God than nothing. 
they were not the servants of the Lord because they were fighting. They had the wrong concept of the kingdom. And do you know how that got started? The Pope put out a word that anybody that will go and fight in Jerusalem and try to drive out the enemy forces and reestablish Christianity, that is, with the Pope on the throne, I will give them free access to heaven. I'll just focus calm and lotion. You ain't got no sins. You go straight on in. And it was amazing how many people that ought have had good sense. They had good sense about everything else. These were rich men. These were powerful men. These were rulers that went over there to fight. But they didn't have sense. God gave a billy goat when it came to the kingdom of God. And neither do the people in our age today who are trying to establish a physical, literal, earthly kingdom and not let, excuse me, I hate saying that, and not allow God to do what he would do as far as establishing a kingdom that is spiritual. My kingdom is not of this world. Now, what are you going to do about that? My kingdom is not of this world. That's what Jesus said. You don't need Matthew Henry's commentary. You don't need Dr. Bottle Stopper to tell you what that means. It just means my kingdom is not of this world. Who said it? The king himself. But we want you to preach to us the things that are literal. You're occupying the wrong pew. You're not going to hear that from me because that's not the truth. It's the lie that's been set forth that is deceiving so many people. Now listen. Matthew 26. The book of Matthew. Chapter 26. In verse number 27. Well, you know me. Go back to 26. Matthew 26, 26. And as they, the disciples and the Lord, were eating, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body. Now, the so-called priest in the Roman Catholic outfit, they put a wafer on people's tongue and say, the body of Christ. And they think that because they bless it and put it on somebody's tongue, it literally, physically becomes the flesh of Jesus Christ. How dumb can you be? Dear soul, we are so blinded concerning the things of the Spirit. Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. Listen now, for this is my blood of the new covenant, the new testament, the new contract, which is shed for many, not for all, but for many, for the remission of sins. Now listen, <clears throat> how did, <clears throat> excuse me, how did the Lord Jesus look upon this? Matthew 26 and verse 29. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's what? Kingdom. I'm not going to drink this fruit of the vine until the kingdom comes on earth as it is in heaven. When the Holy Spirit comes, then where two or three of you are gathered together, there will I be in the midst. And as you drink of the new wine of the Holy Spirit and the blood of the Lamb of God, and in the blood is life, I will be involved in, in that with you. It's a spiritual understanding, dear soul. We don't drink literally his blood. We don't eat literally his flesh. But we are so uh, cast upon him, and he is absolutely necessary for our life that our sustenance is the manifestation of God to our souls by the Holy Spirit, insomuch that we are like those who feast off of 
of food. We feast off of Christ. The little newborn babe taken from the mother's body is cast, cast again upon that body to get the, uh, the milk that is necessary for it to uh, maintain life. So he who gives life is the only one that can maintain life. So the song said, I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. Stay thou nearby. So we must, as it were, consume Christ. That's a spiritual thing, friend. He said, I will not drink it with you until the day that I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Isn't that something? I will drink it new with you. Look at uh, Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. I'm just trying to open up your mind and heart to the scriptures. You say, well, I'm kind of confused. Good. Then you, you wasn't confused when you started this. You were happy with ignorance. Excuse me, I don't mean to be rude. But, you know, it's good to be confused. At least I'm not still under the deceptions that I was under. I may not fully understand and know how it lays out, but I know that what I did know was wrong. So let's, let's see what God says for us. Luke chapter 17, verse number 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, listen, this is again Christ talking about the kingdom. The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. In A.D. 33, somewhere thereabout, they saw Alexander the Great come riding in and take over. They had seen the Roman power come in and take over. Their so different nations had taken over from other nations and they saw it was observed that the new kingdom came in and the old kingdom was set aside. He said, that's not how it's going to be with my kingdom. The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Why? Because it comes by the Holy Spirit regenerating souls, and you can't see that. But that's how God establishes his kingdom. Neither shall they say, lo, here, well, we got a revival going on here, over here in Brownsville, Texas, and people are speaking in tongues. Well, we, 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 we got a great thing going over here, down here in Florida, and, and, and we know it's, it, no, you don't. If it can be observed, it's not the kingdom. Neither shall they say, lo there, or lo here. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. It's within your hearts and among you and surrounding you, the Amplified says. And he said unto them, unto the disciples, The days will come when you shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. Listen, dear soul. God said, listen, you're enjoying me being here. You're not really paying attention. You're, you're trusting in me too much. You're not living by faith in yourself. And he said, you're going to be desiring of seeing one of these days of Jesus walking around in Israel, and you're not going to see it. Turn over to Luke 22 and verse 37. Luke 22 and verse 37. For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors. Listen. For the things concerning me have an end. There's going to come an end. While they beheld, he was received up out of their sight. That's it for Jesus. The things of me have an end. But I will not leave you comfortless. 
I will send you another comforter where, where the Lord ended in his physical ministry. The Holy Spirit began on Pentecost and is still with us today. He shall be with you and shall be in you because, quote, the things concerning me have an end. That's what Jesus said. So the kingdom is not physical. It is actual. Listen. In John chapter 6. And verse number 63. Let me explain something to you. John 6 and verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth. What does that mean? Makes alive. It is the spirit that makes alive. The flesh profiteth nothing. That's what you got going on in 99.9% of religion in our day. Oh, they're stirring up a lot of interest. Just like the dry bones are making a lot of noise and stirring up a lot of dust, but there's no life in it. And he says, the flesh profiteth nothing. nothing. Listen now, be sure and listen. This is Jesus again speaking. The words that I speak unto you, two things. They are spirit and they are life. If my words are not spiritual, then there's no life in them. And what did he say about words that were not spirit? The letter of the law killeth. It's the spirit of the word that quickeneth and maketh alive. So God's word should be received spiritually. Why are we not receiving that? Because most of those in the pulpits are not born again. These people had the wrong idea about the kingdom because the Spirit hadn't come yet. People in our day, religion in our day, preachers in our day are in agreement with their literal interpretation of Christ having an earthly kingdom. And guess what? It's the same reason because they don't have the Holy Spirit to open up their hearts and open up the Scriptures. To open up the Scriptures and to open up their understanding. Our time is gone. Let me read you two more verses and, and, and we'll close. John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Jesus said in verse 22 to the, to the, apost no, to the Pharisees, Ye worship, ye know not what. No, he said that to the lady at the well. That's right, to the Samaritan. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. If you're not worshiping God in spirit and in truth, you haven't been sought of God. God had not been looking for you. You're just uh, filling up a bench. You're just warming a, a place in the church on a bench. You're just going through the motions. Listen, last verse, verse 24. God is spirit. Brother Mike Conrad taught us that many years ago. That word A, a is not in there. It doesn't read God is a spirit. It reads God is spirit. And they that worship him, watch this word, must worship him in spirit and in truth. That's what God said. So wilt thou again restore the kingdom at this time to Israel? Wrong question. Wrong idea. Wrong concept. Jesus didn't even go into a discussion of it. He just said, you're fixing to receive the Holy Spirit, and he's going to show you that your idea of the spirit and ruling and reigning with a literal David on a literal throne is, is, is fooey. And you're going to know then that your job is a, 
to be a witness of me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the other most part of the earth. And it still is. I hope God has helped you with this. I hope God would bless you and make you, uh, uh, your eyes, your, your understanding to be open and you will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all these other things will be added. This thing will open up to you if you get the kingdom right. I need to hush. Time's gone. Thank you.